Hello everyone, welcome back. You're watching Beyond World is One. This is World DNA, the show that gets you ahead of the rest. I'm Shivan Janna. And I'm Hem Kaur Suran on the show today. Now, after reports of deaths of five foreign aid workers in the Gaza Strip, the IDF chief has now apologized for the unintentional killing of the World Central Kitchen aid workers. As per Israel, the attack was a mistake that followed a misidentification. Now the question is, at this juncture, is an apology enough? At a time when pressure is increasing on Israel over its handling of the situation in Gaza, to what end can Israel justify its operations in Gaza? Now that's something we'll explore on the show today. Also on the show, US President Joe Biden spoke to Chinese President Xi Jinping. The call follows the meeting between the two back in November last year. President Biden emphasized the importance of maintaining peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait and the rule of law and freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. We will be getting you all the details of that meet as well. Big developments coming in from Taiwan as well. We are going to be tracking that closely. Let's get you started with the headlines. This is World DNA. A 7.2 magnitude earthquake hits Taiwan. Tsunami waves as high as 3 meters expected in report in remote Japanese islands as well. The humanitarian situation in Gaza is likely to worsen as charities announce they are suspending operations in the aftermath of an Israeli strike that targeted a clearly identified convoy of international aid workers. U.S. President Joe Biden condemns Israel killing of seven humanitarian aid workers in Gaza, says he is outraged and heartbroken accuses Israel of not doing enough to protect aid workers. U.S. President Joe Biden seeks to manage tensions over the South China Sea and Taiwan's May presidential inauguration in a call with Chinese President Xi Jinping, their first direct talk since the meeting back in November last year. Thirty-nine-year-old Cristiano Ronaldo cannot stop scoring. The five-time World Player of the Year notches his second hat-trick in the space of 72 hours as Al Nasser brought Aba 8-0 in the Saudi Pro League. All right, we're beginning in with uh, beginning with the major news that's coming in from Taiwan, where a powerful 7.2 magnitude earthquake jolted the island's capital of Taipei. Well, the quake has prompted tsunami warnings in the self-ruled island parts of southern Japan and the Philippines. Now, the epicenter of the quake is recorded in waters off the eastern coastline of Taiwan. As per Taiwan's weather administration, the quake hit at a depth of 15.5 kilometers, collapsing buildings in the Hualien city and trapping several people. Now, this is also the strongest quake to have hit the island in the last 25 years. Japan has alerted evacuation advisory for the coastal areas of the Okinawa Prefecture on a scale of 1 to 7, Tokyo's authorities have slated the quake at an upper 6. This comes as tsunami waves as high as 3 meters were expected immediately in Japanese islands in the region. The quake was also felt in several regions in China. This includes the Fujian province and the Shanghai region. Meanwhile, the Philippines has issued warnings in its coastal regions, urging residents to evacuate to higher grounds. All right, let's shift our focus now. Israel is facing major diplomatic backlash over the airstrike that killed seven international aid workers. 
Well, of course, this happened while they were delivering desperately needed food to the Gaza Strip. Now, Israel's Defense Forces Chief of Staff, Hezi Halevi, has issued an apology for last night's deadly Israeli strike on an aid convoy in Gaza. He says the strike was a result of misidentification. Last night, seven employees of the World Central Kitchen were killed. The IDF completed a preliminary debrief. I want to be very clear. The strike was not carried out with the intention of harming WCK aid workers. It was a mistake that followed a misidentification at night during a war in a very complex conditions. It shouldn't have happened. The Israeli chief of staff further added that an independent body will carry out a thorough investigation that will be completed in the coming days. The findings of the investigation will be shared with the World Central Kitchen and other relevant international organizations. On the other hand, Israel's closest ally, the United States, has slammed the country over these strikes. According to the White House, U.S. President Biden is outraged and heartbroken by the Israeli airstrike. He has called on Israel to do more to protect aid workers. We were outraged to learn of an IDF strike that killed a number of civilian humanitarian workers yesterday from the World Central Kitchen, which has been relentless in working to get food to those who are hungry in Gaza and, quite frankly, around the world. We send our deepest condolences to their families and loved ones. The American president also pointed out the difficulties which are being faced by aid workers in Gaza. He says the conflict has been one of the worst in terms of how many aid workers have been killed. In a statement, Biden said the major reason why distributing humanitarian aid in Gaza has been so difficult is because Israel has not done enough to protect aid workers, trying to deliver desperately needed help to civilians. Now, for more on this, we are being joined by Jacob Aldor, Director of Reset at, at the Center for Defense and Strategy from Washington, D.C. So, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, as we mentioned earlier, the IDF has apologized for the unintentional, that's what they're calling it, the unintentional killing of the aid worker, saying this was due to a misidentification of targets. Of course, the question is, is an apology enough? Well, thank you so much for having me on the program. Good morning. Um, the audio you just played of uh, the IDF spokesperson uh, reporting out the initial findings of an investigation uh, indicate indeed that this was a misidentification. It is a tragedy, of course, and that not to minimize it at all. Um, and But, you know, I think what we're seeing, it's important to emphasize, is transparency and due diligence in conducting an investigation. I mean, these types of tragedies happen in conflict areas, um, and the White House spokesperson, John Kirby, said earlier in the day as well that the United States has found no instances, in fact, of Israel violating international law uh, in its conduct of its operation against Hamas throughout this conflict, and that indeed the strike was not uh, uh, intentional as the preliminary findings uh, reveal. So I think it's important to put it into that context of the extreme care and precautions that Israel is taking, but that indeed, uh, as, as uh, General Hagari said, uh, in the complex conditions at night, misidentification happens. And these types of tragedies, unfortunately, do take place. The point is also that if we talk about Israel's allies as well, at this point, they are seemingly extremely irked by how Israel has been carrying out its operations. So, of course, the question is, is Benjamin Netanyahu really pushing the boundaries here and testing its allies' patience at a time when the humanitarian toll is through the roof? Of course, the situation in Gaza is devastating, to say the least. There have been numerous calls for Israel to really rein, its, rein in its operations. The fact is, I mean, as, as Mr. Kirby uh, emphasized yesterday, uh, there is no change in the support the United States is giving to Israel. They are coordinating very closely, including with the imminent um, operation in, in Rafah, um, and they are working overall very closely together. So there is no change in the kind of the measure of support from the United States or other allies to Israel. Um, and indeed, as, as Mr. Kirby said, uh, the threat remains very acute from Hamas, and Israel is 
right to uh, make sure that October 7th does not repeat itself and to do what it takes vis-a-vis -vis Hamas uh, to, make, uh, to prevent that from happening. All right. That was Jacob Olerod joining us from Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for your insight. Thank you. All right. With that, let's also discuss the, what this war is costing Gaza. Mm -hmm. A joint report by the World Bank and the United Nations, it's estimated the cost of the ongoing Israel-Hamas war in Gaza at $18.5 billion. Well, the total infrastructure damage is equal to 97% of the combined gross domestic product of the West Bank and Gaza in 2022. Every sector has been affected by the ongoing war, with housing accounting for 72% of the costs. Public service infrastructure such as water, health and education account for 19% of the total damage. <laughs> Commenting on the scale of the damage, the World Bank said, and I'm going to quote here, catastrophic cumulative impacts on physical and mental health have hit women, children, the elderly and persons with disabilities. The hardest with the youngest children anticipated to be facing lifelong consequences to their development. Over a million people are without homes and 75% of the population is displaced. The continuous bombing of the strip has left 26 million tons of debris and rubble that would take years to remove. The report adds that more than half the population of Gaza is on the brink of famine while the entire population is experiencing acute food insecurity and malnutrition. All right. Now, U.S. President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping engaged in a crucial phone call. China's state agency described the call as candid and in-depth. Now, there was a lot on the cards here. They discussed bilateral ties, global issues, including progress on counter-narcotics and cooperation in artificial intelligence. Reports suggest the two sides are also expecting a call between their top military officials soon. This was the first time the leaders talked since a meeting in November last year. Around that time, both US and China agreed to reopen military communications and cooperate to curb fentanyl production. Now, the agreement was seen as a sigh of relief amid their strained relationship. But during the call, the Taiwan issue took the center stage. According to the White House, Biden stressed the significance of upholding peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait and ensuring the rule of law and freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. Responding to Biden's remarks, Chinese President Xi Jinping has made a resolute declaration emphasizing that the Taiwan issue represents the foremost insurmountable red line in Sino-U.S. relations. Although, according to reports, the Chinese president has acknowledged that relations between China and the U.S. are showing signs of stabilization. But Xi Jinping has cautioned about the potential of sliding into conflict or confrontation. The telephonic conversation comes as Washington and Beijing are at loggerheads on multiple fronts, sovereignty claims over Taiwan, China's support for Russia's war against Ukraine, as well as human rights abuses in Xinjiang. Denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and lastly tensions in South China Sea. Now for more on this, our correspondent Susan Tehrani has sent us this report from New York. Listen to this. President Biden held a telephone conversation with China's leader Xi Jinping to discuss various issues like combating the drug problem, the Middle East conflict and China's support for Russia in the war with Ukraine. The call aimed to be a check-in rather than a summit with a significant outcome. It comes during a pivotal political year and amidst efforts to stabilize U.S.-China relationship, which hit a multi-decade low last year after that spy balloon incident. The call also comes days before U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is expected to visit China. That visit will be followed by U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. Susan Tehrani reporting from New York for We On World Is What. Voters in New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island and Wisconsin are casting their ballots in the 2024 presidential primary on Tuesday. Democratic President Joe Biden and his Republican rival, former President Donald Trump, are both expected to easily secure wins in the primaries in these four states. 
Well, New York has 268 delegates up for grabs in the Democratic presidential primary and 92 delegates are up for grabs in the Republican presidential primary. The New York State Board of Elections has reported more than 100,000 voters across the state which have already cast their ballots during the eight days of early voting which ended last Saturday. The bigger question which persists for Democrats is the number of people protesting against President Joe Biden's policies regarding the ongoing war in West Asia. Democrats can vote uncommitted in Connecticut and Rhode Island to oppose the president's handling of the Israel-Hamas war. In Wisconsin, voters can choose the un instructed delegation option but this choice is not prevalent in new york and the people who want to convey a message to the president are being urged to leave it blank activists are pressuring the president over the gaza crisis and are urging voters to leave the ballots unmarked And Russian President Vladimir Putin has appointed new Navy commanders. Admiral Alexander Mosiev is the new Navy chief of Russia. Well, Mosiev will replace Admiral Yevmenov. Putin also named the appointment of the new commander of the Navy's Black Sea Fleet. Notably, these appointments come after the loss of several Russian warships in the Black Sea. Earlier, Ukraine's Navy claimed that it has sunk or damaged one-third of all Russian warships in a series of Ukrainian drone and missile attacks in the Black Sea. Meanwhile, the Russian missile attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure, particularly on civilian buildings, continue. In Ukraine city of Dnipro, a Russian missile attack damaged an educational facility. According to local authorities, the attack injured 18 people. On the other hand, as Russia continues to attack Ukrainian cities and towns, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has signed a crucial bill that will lower the mobilization age for combat duty from 27 to 25. The move aims to boost Ukraine's efforts to generate more fighting power against Russia. The bill has been with Zelensky since May 2023 after it was approved by the lawmakers. However, it is still not clear what prompted Zelensky to sign it. In total, Zelensky has signed three bills regarding military service. The second bill requires men who were given military waivers on disability grounds to undergo another medical assessment. And the third bill aims to create an online database of those eligible for military service. Ukrainian troops are facing several challenges on the battlefield in shortage of ammunition supplies, uh, which is a crucial aid from the U.S., which has been blocked by Republicans in Congress for months and European Union failing to deliver vowed ammunition on time. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with France's Minister of Defense in Paris, where both the leaders discussed the ongoing collaboration with Europe in supporting Ukraine. But we are at a critical moment where it is absolutely essential to get Ukrainians what they continue to need to defend themselves, particularly when it comes to militias uh, and air defense systems. So there's a year-term challenge that we're working together to meet. It's another reason why the supplementary budget request that President Biden has made to Congress must be fulfilled as quickly as possible. Later today, NATO foreign ministers will meet to discuss a long-term military support plane for Ukraine. This includes a proposal for $107 billion five-year fund. The proposal by NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg will give the Western Alliance a more direct role in coordinating the supply of arms, ammunition and equipment to Ukraine. Meanwhile, UK Foreign Secretary David Cameron called for NATO allies to bolster defence spending and production in support of Ukraine. Reports claim in the two-day summit in Brussels, Cameron will ask the allies to endorse British-led initiatives to procure NATO standard missiles and munitions for the Ukrainian armed forces. Weeks after Nigerian gangs abducted students and school staff, the freed hostages have returned to their homes. Tears, prayers, rejoicing families were seen welcoming their children after initially losing hope to ever see their loved ones again. Take a look at our next report. Villages run toward a bus carrying the last set of children who were abducted from their school in Nigeria's northwest on March 7th. Days before a deadline to pay a 1 billion naira or $767,000 ransom for their release, 
The army announced it had rescued all 137 hostages, but only 127 were taken back to the village, and 10 stayed back in town for further medical treatment. Honestly speaking, we were in such a terrible situation that can only be imagined. Even the food we were given to eat is better imagined and not something a human being should be given to eat. Abductions at Nigerian schools were first carried out by jihadist group Boko Haram, which seized 276 students from a girls' school in Chibok in northern eastern Borno state a decade ago. But since then, criminal gangs without ideological affiliation have adopted the tactic to obtain ransom money. Earlier this week, Information Minister Mohamed Idris said no ransom had been paid. One security source said he saw 14 black bags, which he assumed contained the ransom money, being delivered to an area in Zamfara State where the students were held after their March 7th abduction. And with that, it's time now for a short break. Don't go anywhere. This is World DNA. We will be back after a break. When we come back, we bring you more updates from Pakistan, where jailed former Prime Minister Imran Khan claims that his wife, Bushra Bibi, was poisoned while being imprisoned at his private residence in Islamabad. Khan has claimed that General Asim Munir will be responsible if his wife is harmed in any way. We'll get you the complete story. Also on the other side, the United States and UK sign an MOU which will see the two nations work together to develop tests for the advanced AI models. The MOU follows the commitments announced at an AI safety summit. More details on the other side. Stay tuned. India's global voice, the channel that brings you the biggest stories from across the world through India's lens. Now available in more than 190 countries worldwide, because we believe that the world is one. Watch us in Africa, Europe, USA and Canada, South America, Asia Pacific, Middle East and North African regions. Also available on these digital platforms across the world. We on. World is one. Everyone loves a contest. But sport isn't just about victory and defeat. When the goats in sport speak, you hear it first on Weon. You have to play good cricket over a period of time. You know, I should push myself right out of the damn tournament. We go beyond the stats. Our stories are quoted the world over. At We On, sport is part of our DNA. Come, join us on this journey. Weekday, 6.30 p.m. IST, 1 p.m. GMT. The biggest democratic exercise on the planet ever. Decoding the multiple colors of this multi-dimensional, multi-layered spectacle. Mian deciphers the images and the hues, sifts real performance from rhetoric and noise, claims and counterclaims, populist pitches and hidden truths. Untangling, unraveling this celebration of democracy. The Indian Air Force has always been the first responder for any such crisis across the globe. And in the past uh, many years, we have actually uh, developed our skill level and training level to execute such missions with a uh, fair amount of confidence. The center of gravity, like they said, is now the Indo-Pacific region for all the militaries to re keep our focus on. Our initial uh, issue was with sustaining and maintaining our forces at high altitudes in the eastern Ladakh in particular. Good help from and administrative support from the Indian Army and the ITBP. I think we are now quite uh, well settled, I would say, in those high altitude regions. Providing uh, supplies during any humanitarian disaster situation. 
or whether it is rescuing our uh, or evacuating our diaspora mm. from anywhere across the globe i think we have the wherewithal the capability and the training to carry out such missions On the next episode of World of Africa, democracy wins as Senegalese elect their first youngest president in Diomaye Faye, who now succeeds Maki Sall, who had previously imprisoned him and firebrand opposition figure Usman Sonko. Faye pledges to govern with humility. Chocolate prices to keep rising as West Africa's cocoa crises deepens. Top growers in Ivory Coast and Ghana are facing catastrophic harvests resulting in record high cocoa prices. And tropical cyclone Gamani sweeps across the island of Madagascar, killing dozens and displacing thousands more. Watch Wild of Africa at these times on Beyond Wild is One. The biggest democratic exercise on the planet ever. Decoding the multiple colors of this multi-dimensional, multi-layered spectacle. Mian deciphers the images and the hues. Sifts real performance from rhetoric and noise, claims and counterclaims, populist pitches and hidden truths. Untangling, unraveling this celebration of democracy. Welcome back to World DNA. Thank you so much for staying with us. Here's a look at all that we've lined up for you on this side of the show. Let's start by looking at the headlines. A 7.2 magnitude earthquake hits Taiwan. Japan issues tsunami alert. Tsunami waves as high as 10 feet expected in remote Japanese islands. The humanitarian situation in Gaza is likely to worsen as charities announce that they are suspending operations in the aftermath of an Israeli strike that targeted a clearly identified convoy of international aid workers. US President Joe Biden condemns Israel's killing of seven humanitarian aid workers in Gaza, says he is outraged and heartbroken, accuses Israel of not doing enough to protect aid workers.
U.S. President Joe Biden seek to manage tensions over the South China Sea and Taiwan's May presidential inauguration in a call with Chinese President Xi Jinping, their first direct talk since meeting in November last year. Khyber Pakhtunkhwa police in Pakistan issues alert over a possible suicide attack planned by the TTP on the eve of Eid. Thirty-nine-year-old Cristiano Ronaldo cannot stop scoring. The five-time World Player of the Year notches his second hat-trick in the space of 72 hours. As Al Nasser rout Aba 8-0 in the Saudi Pro League. A powerful 7.8 magnitude earthquake jolted Taiwan's capital of Taipei. Now the quake has prompted tsunami warnings in the self-ruled islands, parts of southern Japan, and the Philippines as well. The epicenter of the quake is recorded in waters off the eastern coastline of Taiwan. As per Taiwan's Weather Administration, the quake hit at a depth of 15.5 kilometers, collapsing buildings in the Hualien city and trapping several people. This is also the strongest quake to have hit the island in the last 25 years. Japan has alerted evacuation advisory for the coastal areas of the Okinawa prefecture on a scale of 1 to 7 Tokyo's authorities have slated the the quake at an upper 6 and this comes as tsunami waves as high as 3 meters that's nearly 10 feet were expected immediately in Japanese islands in the region yeah. The quake was also felt in several regions in China these include the Fujian province and the Shanghai region Meanwhile, the Philippines has also issued warnings in its coastal regions, urging residents to evacuate to higher grounds. And for more on this, we're now being joined by Ross Terrell Feingold, political analyst from Taipei. Thank you so much for joining us sir, on World DNA. The epicenter of the quake was just south of Taiwan's Hualien City. What's the ground situation? It's very frightening. Uh, you know, some earthquakes, uh, you could tell right away that it's, it's going to shake but not be particularly strong. And then an earthquake like this one uh, today, it, it was a strong shake right from the beginning and it continued to get stronger. So we're seeing reports of uh, a, a few building collapses. There's blackouts, uh, train service in many parts of Taiwan stopped and is slowly resuming after the lines are checked for any damage. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned, the authorities have said that this is the strongest earthquake in 25 years. Unlike that earthquake 25 years ago, where the epicenter was actually onshore, the epicenter today was slightly offshore, which probably means that the, there will be damage, but it, wouldn't, it won't be as significant as, as it would have been had the epicenter been onshore. Uh, Mr. Feingold, now tsunami waves as high as 10 feet are expected. How far is uh, the effect being felt how far is that impact going to be felt across Taiwan and beyond? Usually Taiwan itself doesn't get very high tsunami waves. It tends to be a problem that uh, Japan is more susceptible to. Uh, but uh, yeah, warnings have been issued and of course people shouldn't uh, go near the seashore. A, a bigger risk for Taiwan, and we've already seen several uh, instances this morning according to local media reports keeping in mind that the the center of taiwan is a mountainous region there's going to be landslides and as i said we've already seen a few uh, reported by the television so a lot of villages are actually high up in the mountains or along the mountains in taiwan including near the epicenter in hualien county so uh, definitely a uh, landslide risk is something that authorities and residents need to be aware of all right that was uh, ross darrell feingold joining us from taipei Thank you for sharing all your insights. Stay safe, sir. Thank you. 
All right, let's shift our focus now. Pakistan's jailed former Prime Minister Imran Khan has alleged that his wife Bushra Bibi was poisoned while being imprisoned at his private residence in Islamabad. Well, the Pakistan Tehreek-e Insaf chief has pinned responsibility on the country's army chief, General Asim Munir, saying that General Munir will be quote unquote responsible if she is harmed in any way possible. While attending a hearing in the Tosha Khana case, the PTI chief reportedly told the judge about Bushra Bibi's condition he claimed that bushra bibi had marks on her skin and tongue as a side effect of the poisoning the 71 year old former prime minister further claimed that members of an intelligence agency are controlling everything at his banigala residence imran khan has additionally called upon the court to mandate a medical examination of his 49 year old wife by dr asim from shaukat khanum hospital this apart from pleading for an inquiry into the alleged poisoning of bushra bibi The court has instructed Khan to provide a comprehensive application detailing the request for Bushra Bibi's medical examination. On Monday, Pakistan's High Court suspended both Imran Khan and his wife Bushra Bibi's 14-year sentences in the Tosha Khana corruption case. The couple was sentenced in the case by an Islamabad accountability court on the 31st of January, days before the general elections. Moving on in a concerning development that has come to light in Pakistan as well where eight judges including the chief justice of Islamabad high court received mysterious letters well these letters contained powders now investigation reveals that the powder is anthrax according to court's sources one of the letters was opened by a judge staff who later complained of irritation in the eyes following the discovery of these letters court sources disclosed that along with the powder the letters also contained threatening signs the letter also does not have sender's address and islamabad high court has summoned islamabad inspector general and handed over the letters to the police for further investigation the first anthrax laced letters were mailed in the united states in 2001 this was a week after the deadly 911 attack in new york the letters contained white powder which was uh, which had anthrax spores which was sent to two US senators offices and news media agencies the letters caused a complete shutdown of the US senate's office we are well into april and we embark upon a new quarter the global economic landscape continues to witness dynamic shifts shaping our collective pursuit of prosperity most major economies including the united states have sidestepped forecasts of a recession in 2024 but what's in store for these economies as we look forward take a look at our next report to find out 2024 has been a better year for economies than previously expected Several major economies including the US have avoided a recession and now the anticipation is mounting for potential interest rate cuts across major economies. Investors worldwide are closely monitoring signals from the Federal Reserve recognizing the impact such decisions can wield on markets. The stock market remains a compelling arena for wealth creation. The stellar performance of tech giants like Nvidia has underscored the role of innovation and digital transformation in driving momentum. Recent weeks have witnessed a resurgence in sectors such as energy and autos, reflecting renewed investor confidence in the broader economic recovery. As the world looks for growth, India has positioned itself as the fastest growing major economy. India's focus on its defense capabilities has assumed significance amidst evolving geopolitical dynamics. India's tech services industry continues to be a cornerstone of its economic landscape. Although analysts forecast a subdued quarter for the major players in the sector, India's emphasis on digitalization offers investors the right opportunity to invest in India. Indian markets touched a new record high this week. as investor sentiment remains strong as markets bask in optimism it's crucial to acknowledge the accompanying risks with india set to inaugurate a new government this quarter political uncertainties loom large bureau report we on world is one 
All right, and Fitch Ratings has affirmed Israel's long-term sovereign debt rating at A+, despite the ongoing conflict in Gaza. Now, however, the outlook has been downgraded to negative, signaling caution amid heightened geopolitical risks. This decision comes in contrast to Moody's ratings downgrade in February. Now, sovereign credit ratings gauge government's capability and commitment to timely and full repayment of commercial debt. Despite a credit ratings boost by Fitch, Israel's prolonged conflict in Gaza has posed significant fiscal challenges for the country. The central bank estimates the cost of the conflict at $68 billion over 2023 to 2025. Despite the government's implementation of spending cuts and new taxes, Israel continues to grapple with a substantial deficit, reaching 6.6% of its GDP. Fitch projects a further increase in debt levels with the debt-to-GDP ratio expected to rise to 65.7% in 2024 and 67% in 2025. The economic repercussions of the conflict are also evident in the financial markets. Israeli shekel and dollar bonds are both in decline, while Finance Minister Bezalel Smotrich remains optimistic about Israel's economic resilience. Fitch calls for prudent fiscal management to tackle ongoing uncertainties. The Indian government has taken a step to address concerns over information security. An internal advisory has been issued by officials on the threat of information leakage through CCTV cameras. Indian ministries and departments have been advised to stay clear of brands with a track record of security breaches. Now, the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology released an advisory in March, urging adherence to procurement guidelines to safeguard the overall security of CCTV cameras and other internet-connected devices. This move comes after cybersecurity incidents were noticed by the Indian government that originated from security flaws in surveillance cameras. In its advisory, the government has emphasized the benefits of surveillance technology but also highlighted associated risks. Now, the advisory said, and I'm quoting here, while these surveillance technologies offer a range of benefits and are valuable tools for monitoring the security, they also raise certain concerns. Risks associated with CCTV systems include data security, privacy breach, hacking and cyber attacks. The notification also lays down the initial requirements for ensuring the security of CCTV cameras. This includes temper-resistant camera enclosures, encryption protocols and proper maintenance of security networks. Now, the United States and UK also signed an MOU which will see the two nations work together to develop tests for the most advanced AI models. Well, the MOU follows the commitments announced at an AI safety summit in Bletchley Park last year in November. The MOU was signed by US Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo and UK Technology Secretary Michelle Donnellan. Under the formal partnership, Britain and the United States plan to perform at least one joint testing exercise on a publicly accessible model. They are also considering exploring personal exchanges and are working to develop similar partnerships with other countries to promote AI safety. Speaking about the partnership, British Technology Secretary Michelle Adonlan said, and I am quoting here, this is the first agreement of its kind anywhere in the world. AI is already an extraordinary force for good in our society and has vast potential to tackle some of the world's biggest challenges. But only if we are able to grip those risks. The partnership will take effect immediately. Generative AI is often seen as a double-edged sword. While its potential is limitless, dangers of artificial intelligence cannot be ignored. With rapid advancements taking place in AI sector, there is an urgent need to secure the cyber environment. As we become more reliant on AI, understanding its potential pitfalls is becoming increasingly crucial. All right, over to sports next. Let's take a look at the stories making headlines all over the world. Tottenham Hotspur were held to a frustrating one-all draw by West Ham United in the English Premier League. 